Welcome to the Sheboygan County Local History Expo and today is May 2nd, 2011. There's going to be lots of things you're going to see and lots of people you're going to meet. Today is very special. We have 21 area organizations, local history organizations, not only from Sheboygan County but from Ozaki County, Calumet County, and Manitowoc County as well, all here today to show all their projects, their events, things that uh, uh, are under strategic plans of things to do and help the community. In addition, this year we have some video of 1930s and 1940s from Sheboygan Falls, Wisconsin. We'll have three speakers today too, Rochelle Pennington, Jim Drager, and Attorney Holbrook. So it's going to be a very, very good day. Thanks for uh, viewing this, uh, this DVD. It's going to be a lot of fun. Hello, I'm Angie Hullen, one of the staff people at the Sheboygan County Historical Museum. We're here at the Local History Expo with, at the museum's booth. Um, I'm sitting here with two of Sheboygan's famous daughters, um, Dorothy Schwartz and Carol Bushman, two of the original members of the Cordettes Singing Group. Um, we were just going to ask them to do a little bit of remembrance about uh, their early days in the forming of the Cordettes. So, Dorothy, <laughs> um, you were on the Arthur Godfrey show as part of kind of the Cordettes. We were fortunate to win the uh, contest in September, in the end of August, and um, he signed us in September, and we became regular Godfrey, little Godfreys in September. We lived in New York. Um, we had we were on every morning radio show, and every Wednesday night the television show. Did you come back to Sheboygan during that time? Um, occasionally, I came back to visit my family, and uh, they had a homecoming for us where we. Uh, sang at the auditorium with Fred Waring and um, they met us at the train depot and we had a parade up 8th Street to the Festi Hotel and uh, it was quite something. <laughs> we were on a convertible and uh, people were on all sides of the street welcoming, welcoming us home. So. Carol, what do you remember about that time? Well, I was thinking of even before that, when we started singing as a barbershop quartet, uh, Ginny, Ginny's dad was uh, King Cole, uh, president of Kingsbury Breweries, and he also was very active in the uh, barbershop organization. And um, she had the music around the house and decided to try singing the barbershop stuff because it, at that time it was pretty 95% men singing. and. We were, we had a little coaching from a good friend in Manitowoc, and uh, they thought we sounded pretty good, so they put us on that Sheboygan show, and uh, we did very well there, and people were so surprised, and all of a sudden we were invited on all these barbershop shows all over the country. We were the novelty, being the, the girls, <laughs> and that was, to me, that always seems like the most fun of our career, like running around and singing all night long on street corners, anywhere, <laughs> and everybody, wherever you went in that town where the barbershop show was, they'd be singing, singing, singing. Very neat. Milton Jason was the man up in Manitowoc that helped us, that coached us. He would let the um, the barbershop court, uh, chorus in Sheboygan, and uh, he kind of taught us how to sing barbershop, the phrasing and the uh, phraseology, the swelling of the, the chords. Uh, he was a good help. Well, he actually gave us the, our style, I would say, with the interpretation of the songs, singing very quietly and getting very loud. And and you didn't have to follow a beat singing barbershop. You just kind of sang to a phrase, a word or so. And uh, yeah, he was responsible for the style which started us. But then, then later, of course, we, we went into um, accompaniment, accompaniment with our songs.
Well, your being um, natives of Sheboygan certainly means a lot to the community of Sheboygan even today. Um, do you have anything to, any words to speak to that, either of you? <laughs> I always had, I always wanted to get back to Sheboygan. I had no intention of staying with the group indefinitely. And when I became pregnant, uh, I knew I was, I wanted to get back to Sheboygan. I had left the group in 52. I had been with the group seven years. And um, I want to get, get back to the real world. <laughs> so we came back at the end of 52, and our son was born in 53. Never sorry for that decision. Well, after Dottie left, uh, and we left the Godfrey show, and Archie Blyer, who was the, um, the music director of the show, had always wanted to put accompaniment to us. And Arthur Godfrey didn't like want that. He wanted us to do Strictly Barbershop. So then uh, Archie formed his record company, and the second song we did was Mr. Sandman. So from there, we went into another direction. But we always sang a barbershop song or two in our, in our act, uh, even though we traveled, you know, played Vegas or whatever, we always had the barbershop there too. But then, of course, songs like Mr. Sandman and Lollipop got us pretty well known, and we got very busy, did a lot of traveling. <laughs> when did you ultimately come back to Sheboygan? Well, we, um, let, let's see, uh, uh, oh, Ginny, who organized the group, decided she had to, uh, her mother was ill, and she wanted to go and, and be with her mother. And then uh, I, I had done enough by that time, too. Uh, in between there, I had a baby. <laughs> but I was only out a couple of months. <laughs> and uh, so I, uh, where was I? <laughs> So anyway, when Ginny said she wanted to leave, I decided it was time for me to go stay home because my little girl was three years old and I wanted to stay home with her and my husband. So then uh, we just kind of disbanded. We had to cancel a few dates and a few of those that we had coming up we made. But uh, then we just kind of retired and that was in, in uh, well, 63 or four or so. So it was close to 20 years the whole group was together, including Dottie's very beginning. I wasn't there that first year, oh, okay. but the rest of the year, and as I said, didn't take me long to have a child. <laughs> I, well, we certainly appreciate having you both here. We consider you treasures in our community, and thank you for being here tonight at the Expo as well. Thank you. Nice meeting you all. I'm Jim Drager from the Wisconsin Historical Society. I'm the Deputy State Historic Preservation Officer of Wisconsin. I'm here at the uh, fair to talk about Wisconsin architecture and um, about some of my favorite um, topics in Wisconsin architecture, including uh, my history of gas stations, Filler Up, The Glory Days of Wisconsin Gas Stations, uh, which was published about two years ago. I'm very interested in ordinary, everyday buildings and uh, what they mean to people. And I thought gas stations was a great topic to uh, talk about the kind of background, everyday buildings that people see every day and use, but don't really think about them as being historic buildings or think about what they mean. So uh, the book traces the history and development of gas stations over uh, from a period of time of about 1900 all the way up to the present and explains why they look the way they do at any point in time and what makes them special. Uh, I also wrote the introduction to Encore, uh, Renaissance of Wisconsin Opera Houses, which is a book that features 10 Wisconsin Opera Houses and traces their stories uh, and talks about the important place that these performing arts centers have in the state of Wisconsin and uh, talks about the the renaissance or the rebirth of them today as performing arts centers. I'm here to talk a little bit about the Wade House and what we've got going on this year. 
We have a lot of our regular programs, but we also have some new programs going on. For instance, we're going to have our Dairy Day. It'll be our second year where we talk about milk, milk products, making cheese, ice cream, and butter. We're also this year brand new to the Wade House is we're going to make beer using 19th century recipes from period cookbooks. So we're going to be making ginger beer and molasses beer and spruce beer. And we have hops here that are used in making the beer and we have ginger beer bottles and beer jugs that we'll be using for bottling our beer. We also have our hearthside dinner programs where we're using our tin kitchen for cooking our meat during those programs. We're also using our wood burning stove for preparing meals. We will be doing jams again in the summer. We're making raspberry jam. And in 1860, this is a time before cans, glass jars, I should say, with the screw on lids. So we're going to be preserving them the way they did in the 19th century, using jelly glasses. We put the jam in there. When it cools, you put brandied paper on top, a piece of paper soaked in brandy. Then you can it or seal it by using layers of tissue paper and then each layer is brushed with egg white and when that egg white dries it fills in all the holes and then you can see it really is it's drum tight so that will keep all the air out um, and keep your jam nice and fresh we also will have our baseball sundays this year again featuring the dead cities baseball club. We'll be taking on the Cream Cities from Milwaukee, the Milwaukee Grays and the Eagle Diamonds. We also will be hosting a Father's Day game where we invite everyone to come out with their dad and they actually will join in and they will play the, the, the Dead City. So it's a lot of fun. It's a participatory. We also have our day camps again this year and our big Civil War weekend in September. Hi, I'm Mary Rousseau from the Sheboygan County Historical Research Center. We are located at 518 Water Street in Sheboygan Falls in the Cole Historic District. Uh, we have been in existence for 28 years now, I believe, and have an estimated 1 million documents and half a million photographs that uh, fulfill our mission of collecting and preserving the history of Sheboygan County. Uh, today we have a, a nice assortment of some of the books that we carry in our bookstore. They range from Roger, uh, Robert Matzner's uh, Prisoner 19053. We have two publications about uh, Dutch immigration and Dutch Immigrant Letters, Bill Wangeman's newest book on Sheboygan, Tales of the Tragic and Bizarre, Rich Dykstra's new, newest book about growing up Dutch in Sheboygan County, On the Home Front, Cheese Factories in Sheboygan County, uh, The Tragedy of the Phoenix Disaster in 1847, a fabulous new 60th anniversary edition of the history of Elkhart Lake and the road races that has wonderful pictures of the early road races uh, that occurred within the village and on the county roads. Um, Betsy Michaels book, The Green Steed. Uh, one of our uh, public school books. Uh, we finally have uh, published the history of Sheboygan Public Schools and our Arcadia series on Sheboygan County, Plymouth, and Sheboygan Falls. We also have some displays today uh, about Sheboygan County trivia. Uh, cemetery trivia, uh, trying to find information about the board, what was called the border of Egypt in Sheboygan County. So if anyone has any information about that, we would love to hear from you. Thanks for stopping by our table. Uh, we represent the Manitowoc County Civil War Roundtable, and uh, our goal is to learn and study more about the American Civil War, which was a very, very tragic period in our history. We started uh, this roundtables are designed to uh, do, to discuss 
and learn more about the period which was uh, so important in our history as I said. Uh, I'm originally from the metropolis of Gibbsville and therefore I'm uh, b back in familiar territory and uh, it's, it's a pleasure to bring some of what the Civil War Roundtable does to the people here at, at the Expo. Roundtable started, in, the first one was in Chicago in 1940, the next one was uh, started in Milwaukee in 1947, and now there are over 300 Civil War Roundtables all around the world, including Australia and Hungary and, uh, or Hungary and Britain and Germany and so forth, that because uh, so many history people want to study uh, what happened in, in this experiment with democracy. We sometimes forget about the fact that here we were only 85 years after the Declaration of Independence and the country was coming apart at the seams. And it wasn't for uh, people like Abraham Lincoln who, who kept us together, we would now be two countries. Uh, the country had developed two different societies uh, one with slaves. Uh, the the uh, in the northern period they discovered that slaves weren't as as important economically. Therefore, uh, when people stop talking about something, they unfortunately start killing each other, and that's what happened here. Families broke up, and uh, the wife of our president, for example, uh, Mary Todd Lincoln's three brothers fought for the Confederacy and two of them died doing that. And when the war started, everybody thought it would be over very, very quickly. Uh, within a matter of months, the U.S. Army had only about 16,000 people in it, and uh, our soldiers, and by the time it was over, uh, around three million men would serve in the, in the Army. One of the things we do for our members is provide an opportunity uh, to buy a magazine called the Gettysburg Magazine. This magazine is devoted strictly to the probably the largest battle ever fought on the uh, North American continent. Very few people realize that in that three-day battle there were 162,000 men involved. Those numbers are just staggering because uh, there's so much greater than anything that we c comprehend or think about uh, in today's battle, or today's uh, world. Uh, one of the things that we are celebrating right now is the 150th anniversary of the Battle of Gettysburg, and our round table has put together some souvenirs, t-shirts, caps, buttons, and so forth to commemorate uh, this period in our history, and uh, we will be marketing those for all those who are interested. I'm Lori Shawhan. I'm a member of the Daughters of Union Veterans of the Civil War. We have an organization in Manitowoc that is part of a national organization for direct descendants of veterans of the Civil War. Actually, there has been, hasn't been a tent in Wisconsin for 50 years, but some of us have ancestors and we wanted to do what we could to honor them and to help the today's veterans. And there are three National Veterans Homes that we help, we make cookies and we make pretty things to raise money for the soldiers and we help buy them sundries to help them. And in our programs that we have monthly, we talk about our veteran ancestors and we have other speakers, like somebody would come to talk to us about Mary Todd Lincoln or Mary Todd Lincoln's sister. We have programs like that monthly meetings and uh, we will have a p family picnic during the summer but mostly we have monthly meetings and meet together and see what we can do to help the soldiers make plans for what we, what we can do to help the soldiers and we have nice programs to teach each other about the history of the Civil War. I'm sorry Oh, Mike, uh, I'm president of the organization, and my name is Lori, L-A-U-R-I-E, Shawhan, S-H-A-W-H-A-N. My address, 3324 Waldo Boulevard in Manitowoc, 54220. We'd love to, have, to hear from anybody who's interested or who has an ancestor who fought in the Civil War. 
she could become, if she's a direct descendant, she could become a member of our organization. And actually, do you know that there are about a dozen ladies who are actual daughters of Civil War veterans, and they can tell the stories that their, aunts, that their fathers told them about the Civil War. And we had a lady, her name was Jeanette Bastival, and she was a granddaughter of a veteran of the Civil War in Manitowoc County, the oldest living veteran of the Civil War. And she was a dear. We lost her just yesterday. And the Daughters of Union Veterans of the Civil War have a special ceremony that we can offer, and we did that yesterday. It's a rather touching and patriotic part of the uh, funeral cere ceremony it was. A lovely lady. We, she was a real joy to listen to her talk about her ancestor because she saw it on, sat on his lap and listened to his stories. We honor our veterans today and the veterans of the Civil War also. It's very much of an honor of us to do this. If we have any questions, we'd love to hear from anybody and help them with their research and help them join our organization if they would care to. My name is Dan Buckman and I'm president of the Plymouth Historical Society that's located in downtown Plymouth. Um, we're primarily collecting information that's relevant to the history of Plymouth and the local area. And on our display, we've got a few things that we brought along today and one of them is actually from the Plymouth Cigar Company. This was a cigar cutter where gentlemen would have cut cigars on here and this is an actual photograph of them making cigars and that building that was located right in the downtown and they would actually wrap them roll them cut them and then they would sell cigars Plymouth uh, made cigars right on that cutter we've also got a few of the old telephone books a lot of times people will come they're actually looking for information on descendants of who lived in Plymouth we have a variety from about 1900 through maybe 1940. They can locate, you know, names. And what's interesting is a lot of the phone numbers that are inside. Uh, if you look up a name, their phone number will be 103 or 141. Uh, very short, no area code, uh, very easy to work with. Um, the other thing that we've been collecting for a number of years too are Plymouth annuals. We've got a series of, series of annuals that start from about 1900 to the current day. And the very, very earliest annuals were actually paper. A paper bound book that was maybe 10 or 12 pages long. Compared to these are like 1950s, uh, obviously in the format that they are. What's interesting is the more current annuals are now going on to discs or CDs. So we're losing our, our ability to look on paper. We've done also a few publications. Walter Bade used to be a historian in Plymouth. Uh, we've taken some of his transcripts and have put those into paper format. Um, he speaks in one of them about growing up in Plymouth. And then he also did a history of Sheboygan County Railroads. This past year, one of our bigger projects was we tried to find Isaac Thorpe and he is the first settler who came to Plymouth in the 1840s. Uh, started to just look for basic information, we ended up actually putting together a CD 60-minute uh, story about Thorpe coming to Sheboygan County. We found a lot of interesting things along the way, and he had a lot of involvement with the Civil War. So the, the, C, the CD tells a lot of Plymouth during the Civil War, and it also talks about him and his family they lived here in the 1840s, but by 1870, they were pretty much out of the Plymouth area already. But he is the gentleman who's credited for building the first log cabin. Then in June, we have a project coming up where uh, it's called the Wall Dogs. There'll be a number of artists coming from around the world, and they're going to be producing different types of ads that will be placed on the outsides of buildings. Many of these ads are or they, they're Plymouth. Uh, companies, the Plymouth Packing Company, uh, sort of the predecessor for the Plymouth Canning Factory. In the early years they made Plymouth ketchup, they also canned vegetables and whatnot. The Plymouth High Ho Company, more recent, but they did make soda and that was located off of Stafford Street. Um, and we've actually found some of the bottles, we created the ad, and we also have a number of um, ads that they reflect what was in Plymouth, such as the railroad, uh, other types of things that went on. The Waldham Gas Company, that pagoda used to be located right in the heart of downtown Plymouth uh, next to the telephone company. That building was torn down in the 1950s, but that mural will be just adjacent to that 
uh, filling station that's currently there, which is now the Frontier Telephone Company. And then we were also noted for beer. Plymouth had a brewing company, um, which is still standing right now. It's the Sartori Cheese Factory, but they did bottle beer there in the late 1800s. That's an actual ad that was on a label that was on a beer bottle, and that'll be recreated uh, onto many of the buildings downtown. So that week of June, June 22nd, going to be a very exciting time in downtown Plymouth because there'll be many artists coming in from around the world and they'll be painting 24 hours a day. People can come and look, they can participate, they can watch and see these things being created. nice uh, keel historical house and what we brought along today is some tools from the past this is a, a drill <clears throat> for uh, drilling holes putting beams together and this is a planer and this is for uh, a clipper for shearing sheep these are hobbles if you have a cow that it likes to kick a lot. You put this around Good down again. by their uh, lower Jim part of their leg. Right here the of the this here is um, sure you put on your gym, shoes for ice. Jim will be doing our presentation at five and this today. here is a veterinary uses for for his for your the farmer's uh, horse. Uh, his back teeth, if they become pointed, he can't chew well, the horse. <laughs> so then uh, the veterinary uses that to grind off that point. And of course, this is for putting in a cider barrel or beer keg for uh, a spigot. And this here is for repairing shoes. Five uh, it goes on a stand and put your shoe on there and then you can pound, pound or put soles on or point, uh, pound nails in or whatever. Okay. You've been soaking your laundry in boiling water to get it clean. You don't want to put your hands in that, so you use this tool to fish it out. Then if your carpeting is soiled, you beat the heck out of it outside. Uh, this is for opening jars with the zinc covers, the canning jars. And then we have an old iron that was kept on the stove and then it was used. It's very heavy. This is for pastry cutting. This is for your matches to grind meat, sharpen knives, and that's a, a early whisk-like. This is for making sausage. No, that's for cherry pitter. Cherry pitter, I'm sorry. And this is for uh, grinding meat, uh, whatever. Behind you is our upcoming program on weddings and anniversaries. It's going to be held in Kiel at the community center and at our historical house. And we're gathering memorabilia, clothes, dishes, various things from uh, early weddings. And we have quite a collection that we'd like to show. And then another thing is, one of our churches lost its records for certain years. And this was a, developed by one of our members. And some of them even have pictures, this is on Find a Grave. And some of them even have pictures of the person that has died. Uh, some have obituaries. And you can link one person to another. It's quite a unique uh, setup. There's a lot of work that was put together. 
and it'll be uh, constantly updated as more information becomes available. This I'm Margaret Wader Schneider, Lifetime Village of Brandom Lake resident. This is my friend Butch Merlin Noack, the great grandson of the Noack, the first house that was built in Random Lake. We're pleased to have you come and see us. We have a little museum and we also have a Noack house that we have on the north end of Random. It's on the uh, Wisconsin Historical Society markers. We're quite proud of it. What, she got something to say? Well, my, my dad bought the property in 1940. He paid $2,500 for the uh, for the house and the uh, animals on the farm and uh, I lived there from 1940 to 1946 then I went into service in 46 and that's when I saw my first plumbing because we had outdoor facilities at the, on the old farm and anyway the surprise for me, my dad sold the house in 1947 while I was in service, and that was supposed to be a surprise for me. <laughs> I was kind of disappointed because I had a lot of ideas what I would have done with that little farm, but it didn't didn't turn out that way. So anyway, he sold, he bought the farm for $2,500. In 47, he sold it for $5,000. Then the person who paid $5,000 for it put it up for sale for $10,000, and he went bankrupt. So it went on a sheriff's sale, and it sold for $6,600. So the Lawrence Scheller bought the bought the property, and they lived there until. 1999, I believe, 1998 or 90, yeah. And uh, then they had the property up for sale, and they were talking about 350,000. You know, so from 2,500 to 350,000 seems unreal. Well, I'm Al Yante. And I'm Mary Yante. And we are volunteer teacher and docent at the Heritage School which is a living history museum in Sheboygan, located near Longfellow School on uh, South 8th Street. The uh, school is, um, was, was created um, as a living history museum and fourth graders from all around Sheboygan County come for a morning of classes to experience what school was like in 1877. The program begins with a visit to the, the museum, which is in one of the what was uh, one of the classrooms and uh, Mary who's the docent will explain the history of the school and what are some of the other things you talk about? We talk about the rules the teachers had for example I get paid thirty dollars a month he gets paid forty dollars a month because he's a male um, I cannot date I, if I get married I am fired uh, and then we talk about other things that the teachers have to do to prepare for the morning of school and uh, then we have them in the classroom. And they have to follow the 1877 rules. Hands on the desk folded. They need to stand on the right-hand side and talk to the teacher, standing straight up and answering. We do uh, math on a, uh, what is that called, the board? Slate. 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 On the slate. Arithmetic, not math. Arithmetic. And uh, we do penmanship with a pen that they use regular, real ink, and they have to dunk it in. And um, they realize how long it takes to write in that way. So another thing uh, we talk about in the winter, the children would have to bring a piece of firewood to keep the stove warm throughout the day that they had school. And that if the child forgot a, got their piece of firewood, they'd have to sit furthest away from the, the stove so if the school ran out of firewood that day, they'd be the first to experience the cold of the, of the room. So it's a wonderful experience. Um, Our backgrounds are, Alan used to be a principal, Jefferson School in Sheboygan, and I used to be an administrator at Milwaukee Area Technical College. And we live in the town of Sheboygan, and um, we've been doing this for about five years, and we thoroughly enjoy it.
Hi, my name is Mike Mayer. I'm the Executive Director of the Manitowoc County Historical Society. And the Society operates two distinct historical sites. We have Pinecrest Historical Village, which is located three miles west of Manitowoc. And we also operate the Manitowoc County Heritage Center, which is our main administrative office and museum and research library. Uh, during the spring, summer, and fall months, uh, Pinecrest Historical Village is open and that consists of 30 historical buildings that were brought from all throughout Manitowoc County, restored by our staff and volunteers, and are now open as a historical village which interprets village life in Manitowoc County around the turn of the century. Um, we do a number of special events, school programs, and we're also open for daily tours. Our other site, the Manitowoc County Heritage Center, is actually in the home of the Old Manitowoc County Teachers Training College and the Society acquired that building in 1998, uh, did the restoration work and now we have a, a beautiful museum, research facility and again our administrative offices there. Uh, we do a number of uh, exciting programs there both for the public and schools. Uh, some of our newest uh, projects that we're working on, we've uh, recently uh, upgraded all of our uh, software that we use to uh, manage our museum's collection. We have over 10,000 uh, archives, objects, and photographs that we use, and we've, uh, again, recently sort of modernized the, uh, the process we use to catalog all those. Um, we are also, as you're looking at right now, uh, working on our, our most uh, kind of exciting project for this year. Uh, in 1998, the Historical Society moved the Hiram McAllister House out to Pinecrest Historical Village. It has uh, sat there for many years waiting for uh, the right time to be transformed into our new Welcome Center. And uh, we will be moving forward with that project uh, this fall, the fall of 2011. So very excited to improve our facilities at Pinecrest Historical Village. Um, and we very much appreciate the opportunity to be here at the, uh, uh, the History Expo. And uh, it's really fun to exchange ideas with people and see what everyone is doing uh, in our area. It's, it's uh, very refreshing to see how many different groups are passionate about their local history, and we're very pleased to be a part of it. Good evening. My name is Kay Nett, and I'm a member of the Board of Directors of the New Holstein Historical Society. Our society is very excited this year to be celebrating our 50th anniversary. We had a very committed group of people that started our organization 50 years ago, and we're lucky to have the same, a different group, but as equally as committed group, uh, helping our, our society to exist now. Our mission, of course, is to collect and preserve and disseminate information about the history of New Holstein and the surrounding area. We do that in various ways. We have lots of programs throughout the years. Uh, throughout the year, we have had various things going on. The biggest of our achievements was probably when we restored the Tim House, which is a home that was built in 1873 uh, in New Holstein. It had had suffered, of course, the uh, years of of um, weather, etc., and we were lucky enough to get a grant from the Jeffress Foundation, and in 2006 we reopened the Tim House, and it's, it's currently in its 1892 splendor. We also operate the Pioneer Corner Museum, which is a museum that, that we have that is in an old store. We have vignettes of various businesses of Old New Holstein. We also have a, an area where we have a, a rotating exhibit that we do for two years at a time. This year we're featuring Let the Games Begin, and it's a, a display about the uh, connections between New Holstein and the Olympic Games. I'm Alan Buchholz and I'm Vice President of the Ozaki County Historical Society. Uh, we are a 500 member uh, group down in uh, Ozaki County and our headquarters is the old Inner Urban Depot in Cedarburg where we've restored one of the only Inner Urban Depots left on the original line. Um, 
We're a custodian for Stony Hill School up in Wabika, which is the birthplace of Flag Day. And we're also, our biggest uh, endeavor is Pioneer Village, uh, which is near Fredonia. On 10 acres, we have uh, 22 buildings that are all fully restored. And inside each building, it's furnished with period uh, equipment, antiques, and things like that. Um, very mature property with large shade trees. The local uh, garden society plants the village every year. And then we have uh, four major events every year, uh, starting with uh, free admissions weekend in June, around Father's Day weekend. And uh, our biggest event is the Revolutionary War reenactment on uh, Labor Day weekend, two-day event with battles uh, at 11 o'clock and 4 o'clock each day as well as a total encampment. We have a bluegrass festival in August. We have a tractor and machinery show uh, in mid-July. And uh, our mission is, is, like a lot of historical societies, is to continue to keep uh, the, uh, the archives of the county, but also keep and restore all of the uh, artifacts and, and, in this case, buildings uh, from the, from the county. We uh, continue to add to the village. Two years ago we added a wood silo and right now we're building a, uh, uh, another log cabin. Uh, my name is Kevin Wester and I'm the executive director of the Luxembourg American Cultural Society and Cultural Center in Belgium, Wisconsin. And we are an international membership society and our focus or our mission is twofold. We celebrate Luxembourg heritage throughout the United States, especially in Ozaki and Sheboygan counties. And then we also uh, preserve or foster relationships between Americans and people in Luxembourg, reuniting people and families, building friendships, and also we promote tourism and commerce between our two countries. We're kind of a new society. We were founded in 2004. We work with the Luxembourg government, the Ministry of Culture, and in 2009 we opened a new cultural center in Belgium, Wisconsin. We have a museum and a research center and also a welcome center and we hold lots of uh, different groups that we welcome and events at our cultural center. The showpiece of our cultural center is the last Luxembourg stone barn that was built in 1872 in the state of Wisconsin. We numbered all the stones on the barn and then we dissembled the barn and we moved it seven miles to Belgium, Wisconsin and that's our museum that's called the Roots and Leaves Museum. We have all different ethnic activities uh, at our cultural center and kind of the highlight of our year is the second weekend of August. We have our Luxembourg Heritage Weekend and Luxembourg Fest of America. We call it the world's largest Luxembourg family reunion. About five or 6,000 people come from throughout the United States and Europe to celebrate their Luxembourg heritage. A lot of people don't know where Luxembourg is. They think it's a city in Germany, but it isn't. It's a separate country, and it's located between Belgium, France, and Germany. It's one of the smallest countries in the world, but considered one of the wealthiest countries in the world. And it is really also known quite well in World War II, because much of the Battle of the Bulge was fought there. General Patton's buried in Luxembourg City with about 6,000 uh, American soldiers who are there. It also has beautiful castles. It's located on the Moselle River, so it has some of the best wines in the world as well. So it's really a unique country. We're proud to be in southeastern Wisconsin, and we're just uh, very excited to have people come and visit us and learn more, not just about Luxembourg, but about immigration in general. So we hope if you ever stop on I-43 right past Belgium, come in and visit us. You don't have to be a Luxembourger, but you can learn about this unique ethnic group and much more about immigration. Okay, this is the Sons of Norway organization, our lodges in Sheboygan and Manitowoc. Uh, about half of our members come from the Sheboygan area and the other half from Manitowoc. So every other month we uh, switch from one place to the other. And here on the table we have some of our things. These trolls right here are hand carved by one of the members of our of our um, lodge. And uh, we've got some rose mauling here that is pretty prominent in Norway. Um, 
there's an old box that comes from Norway. I can't recall how old it is, but this is all some more trolls, dishes that we get with uh, Norwegian dishes. Norway is also known for having a lot of pewter, and uh, over here we have some pewter pieces that are all made in Norway, and uh, these belong to myself and my wife in some of these dishes right here also. Um, another rose mauling stuff on these dishes. Now, the uh, you see we have three different flags here. We have the Norwegian flag, the American flag, and the Canadian flag. And the reason for the Canadian flag is a lot of our immigrants from Norway came through Canada or Ellis Island. So every every one of our meetings we start by singing the Norwegian National Anthem, the Canadian National Anthem, and the American National Anthem. Now in Norway they also have basically two flags. This one is their main flag and it's flown on all uh, government buildings and things like that and on special occasions. The other one is this, this flag right here that <clears throat> is an everyday flag for the Norwegians. And when we visited uh, over there with some of my relatives, we were told that this, the regular Norwegian flag, was flown because they had relatives from the USA. Otherwise, they fly the, the, the banner type flag. And uh, it's a wonderful place to visit. Uh, and if you like fish, it's a great place to visit. And we do have a Lutefus dinner every November. We, pick, we used to pick up along the uh, highways. We have a, a program where we visit the schools and give out mittens and have readings with them. And we give scholarships to children that want to go to Norwegian-speaking camps. I'm Peter Dini from the Oostburg Historical Society. And uh, we've got lots of obituaries and weddings and uh, different history of Oostburg. And uh, some of the buildings that we've got pictures of uh, a lot of building, And we've got a lot of uh, school um, books and uh, we're open on Saturday mornings from 9 to 12 and on Wednesday evenings from 6 to 8 during the summer months and we've got a lot of sports uh, pictures of uh, different teams and this year we're sponsoring the schools High School of Oostburg. Greetings and welcome to Centerville Settlement. We're, we are located up in Manitowoc County just off of, let's see, we're on range. Oh, we're on Union Road, yes. Uh, Union Road and uh, we've got a historic project that we're working on there called the Litzy House Barn. But Centerville Settlement itself is an organization that uh, takes a look at preserving rural heritage. And we're doing that through several different ways. We've got an oral history group. We also have a, uh, a group that offers tours once in a while, silos, looking at stone masonry foundations, and also a bake oven day. One of our major projects includes the restoration of an 1849 house barn called the Litzy House Barn and we're restoring it to about 1870. This timber frame structure is one of a kind in Manitowoc County and also the nation. In fact, in 1982, we received the designation of the National Historic Trust designation. And today here I have with me Kathy Sixel, the president of Centerville Settlement, who's gonna talk a little bit about our display and what we have here. Kathy, come on over. Thank you, Kate. We get over here. Uh, this de uh, display depicts sewing, sew a while, and be in style. And uh, these are all uh, clo clothes or dresses mostly that have been made on a sewing machine. They are all hand stitched or not hand stitched, but they certainly were not bought in a store like today. And um, they've come in a, into the collection. This would be a wedding dress, this would be a bridesmaid dress. 
and at the end we have another outfit that is on a um, on a dress form. Underneath the domes we have various things such as buttons, old sewing machine needles, darning yarn, and over there we have more needles, buttons, and we have safety pins. This is a vest and you can see on the construction it was part with machine, part by hand, and this was the thing to keep it intact. This is a great big uh, pin cushion. And we also have the Madison Square Patterns book. And I have copied several uh, sheets out of there. This pillow was just donated by a woman that's 97 years old. And her mother made it for her. So the uh, pillow is certainly over 100 years old. The display here depicts the Lutzi House Barn, and it is a work in progress, and we work on it every other Saturday. And uh, we have a luncheon at noon, so whoever comes and helps can join us for lunch, and we have a regular dinner. We're, this is from the Aviation Heritage Center out at the airport. We will be having all kinds of stuff going on this summer, plus we have our Father's Day coming up in June, breakfast for for Wings and Wheels, and, and then we have free movie nights out there on every second Friday of the month, so people can come out there and check out the center. How there's all kinds of stuff we got in the museum. We got historical stuff like from Walter Kohler from the air, the old airport we have out there, and then also in July we got the T28s and stuff coming like that and we also sponsor a lot of breakfasts we have out there and we had we had a couple of art we had an art fair out there this year on a Saturday we turned out we had a pretty good turnout for that too so that's open always to the public this afternoon I enjoyed the discussion of how I came to Sheboygan my work here in Sheboygan the things that uh, I appreciate about Sheboygan, some of the reminiscences that I have of the days when I was first here and when I arrived here. I've been on the Supreme Court now for almost 10 years, but I always think of Sheboygan as, as my home. I've lived in Madison, I've lived in Fond du Lac, most of my life I've lived in Sheboygan, and, and Mary and I have had many wonderful years here despite the fact we've had our trials and tribulations uh, but I love Sheboygan.